Weightless mortality is an important metric for transplant programs to measure. This data tells us how likely a candidate is to die while waiting for a transplant at a program. Transplant programs often ask SRTR questions about the methodology behind it. This video is intended to be a comprehensive walkthrough of how the ratios are attained as well as an explanation of person time. And finally, some specific scenarios of how candidates moving on and off the list will affect your mortality rate. SRTR follows a group of people who were waitlisted and were on the list within a given time frame. This is called a cohort. The cohort for the waitlist mortality is two years. SRTR considers everyone who is either added to or on the list at any time during this two-year time frame. This time frame is referred to in the SRTR methodology as the observation period. For that reason, in Table B5, we show how many candidates were on the list at the beginning of the observation period, how many person years accumulated by adding together all the time all candidates spent on the list, and finally how many deaths occurred in that observation period. Observed is exactly that. What events were observed in the observation period? The expected is derived by creating waitlist mortality models based on the national data and applying the models to the specific data for that program. In figures B4, we show the observed versus the expected in graphical form. B4 is segmented by age groups, adult or pediatric. The mortality rate ratio in B5 is basically the hazard ratio for the weightless mortality metrics. The formula is observed plus 2 divided by expected plus 2. This metric basically shows how far off, or close to, expected a program may have come. 1.0 is considered average, and for weightless mortality, if a ratio is below 1, then the program is doing better than average, and if the ratio is above 1, it is doing worse than average. As mentioned in a previous slide, the expected metric is determined by risk adjusting each candidate with the risk adjustment models. It's important to understand the expected metric because it is used not just here in comparison to the observed, but also in the ratio formula in B5 and the mortality rate formula in B6. Risk adjustment models used for determining a program's expected weightless mortality are found here. Under Reports and Tools, select Risk Adjustment Models Waiting List from the drop-down menu. On the Risk Adjustment Models page, you will find the values or coefficients that are assigned to the candidate's characteristics. You will also find which of the characteristics the models determined were predictive or protective. The mortality rate is calculated by dividing the number of deaths by the person years. The expected mortality rate is similarly calculated by dividing the number of expected deaths by the person years. The other part of the formulas for weightless mortality and expected weightless mortality is the person years. Taking a closer look at Table B5, you'll see person years reported here. Understanding how to calculate person years will help you understand how SRTR calculates mortality rates. As previously mentioned, SRTR uses a two-year observation period to analyze data on waitlisted patients. Because candidates can be on the list at the beginning of this period, added during the period, and removed for many reasons during or after the period, the time one patient is on the list differs from others. To account for this, SRTR adds all the candidates' time on a program's list together and refers to it as person years. Person years are calculated as the number of days the candidate was observed and then converted to fractional years for each candidate. This number represents the total time all candidates at this program were on the list. For SRTR calculations, let's say there are two patients at your program. For this example, we'll count days and we'll only look at a one-year time frame. Here we have the total days each candidate was on the list. Person number one has contributed 182 days on the waitlist, and person number two has contributed 300 days. 
Then we divide those days on the wait list by 365 and a quarter. The result is then added together. This equals the person years. The mortality rate is calculated by dividing the number of deaths by the person years. If there was one death, then 1 divided by 1.319 equals 0.758 events per person year. Because events per 100 person years is reported, 0.758 is multiplied by 100 to get 75.8 events per 100 person years. 75.8 is the mortality rate. The expected mortality rate is calculated by dividing the number of expected deaths by the person years. If there was one death expected, then 1 divided by 1.319 equals 0.758 events per person year. As in the previous weightless mortality example, 0.758 is multiplied by 100 to get 75.8 events per 100 person years. But which candidates actually contribute to person time on the waitlist? In a given reporting period, SRTR analyzes a two-year observation period. Any candidate listed by the transplant program before the close of the 24-month period was alive and met inclusion criteria for at least one day during the 24-month period is included. Any candidates already on the list at the beginning of the period are also included. This time the candidate is on the list during the observation period contributes to the patient years metric. Candidates are no longer counted if removed from the list for death, transplant, or recovery. Candidates removed for recovery will be followed for 60 days post the transplant. A death in the 60-day follow-up period will count. Outside of the 60-day follow-up, it will not. No time after transplant is included in the calculation. Once a candidate receives a transplant, they are now part of the post-transplant cohort. An active time on the waiting list is treated no differently from active time. Any candidate that had been on the list for any time during the observation period, but was delisted or was given an inactive status, will still be followed as if active until the end of the observation period. Deaths that occur during periods when the patient is active or inactive on the list are counted in that period. Observation periods roll forward six months every six months, so a candidate can remain in the program's reports and contribute to the person years for some time, depending on when the candidate was waitlisted. Also, depending on if removed or given an active status, they can remain on the list. Their death can also count in multiple reporting periods. Note how this candidate's death remains in the successive reports for at least three cycles. If the candidate was removed for being too sick first, since we continue to follow them until the end of their allotted time period, the length we follow them for can also change. In this example, note how in the first reporting period, the candidate was only followed until the end of the period. But in the next and consecutive reports, the follow-up time extends. Once the observation period rolls beyond when the candidate was removed, they no longer will contribute to the data. If the candidate dies within the follow-up time, the death will count. Notice here that in the first reporting period, the death had not occurred yet and therefore was not counted, but it did occur in the next observation period while the candidate was being followed, so the death does count in that report and the next two reports. Once the observation period rolls beyond when the candidate was removed, they no longer will contribute to the data, and so the death no longer counts. We're going to explore a few scenarios in the next few slides that will illustrate candidates moving on and off the waitlist, and we will spend a little more time looking at what will happen when a candidate is removed for being too sick. In the illustration, the solid lines represent the time these candidates contributed to the waitlist, whether on the list for the whole period, added during the period, or removed during the period. But let's look at some more complicated scenarios. The brackets indicate what person time is counted. Patient A was listed, then removed for being too sick, and died within the observation period. Person time accrues from patient A's list date to death. 
Patient B listed and was removed for being too sick within the observation period. Person time still accrues from the list date to the end of the period for this observation period. Patient C listed and was on the list at the end of the observation period. Person years accrues from the list date to the end of the period. Let's now just look at patient A to illustrate how they would appear on successive reports. Patient D was removed for recovery and was followed for 60 days post-removal. Person time accrued from patient D's list date through the 60th day post-removal. Patient D died after the 60th day follow-up. D's death is not counted because it occurred after the 60-day cutoff. Patient E was also removed for recovery but died within the 60-day follow-up period. Person time accrues from the list date to the death. E's death counted in this period. Patient F was on the list at the beginning of the observation period and removed for recovery before the end of the period, but the 60-day follow-up extended past the cutoff for the observation period. Patient F died after the observation period, but within the 60-day follow-up. Patient F's patient time is counted from the listing to the end of the period. Patient F's death is not counted in this observation period, but will be counted in the next. Patient G transferred from program X to program Y and died after transfer. In SRTR metrics, patient G's time begins at listing and ends at transfer. For program Y, patient G's person time begins at listing and ends at death. The death counts towards program Y's data, not program X's data. There are many other scenarios, but these examples are good baselines to help programs understand situations that may occur. For more specific information on how to use these tools and resources, contact an SRTR representative at srtr.srtr.org. At